Trauma can strike any of us, anywhere, anytime. It's the leading cause of death between the ages of one and 46. The cost of trauma care and lost productivity is over $600 billion in the United States each year. That's more than heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Trauma also can strike close to home. I grew up about a mile away from the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Little did we know that our quiet little neighborhood could be struck by a horrific mass shooting. Yet there's another mass shooting just two nights ago in California. It never ends. One of the most difficult parts of trauma care is having to tell a family of a trauma victim that their loved one didn't make it. Tom Scalia, who's the physician-in-chief of the Shock Trauma Center here in Baltimore, recently commented, how many more parents do I have to tell that their children are dead? We need to do better. When I was a surgery resident at the University of Pittsburgh, and my wife was an emergency medicine resident, we actually came to shock trauma as, as visiting residents, and I distinctly remember seeing a trauma patient who had a stab wound to the heart, and despite doing all the right things, we put in a breathing tube to help him breathe, gave him blood, we opened his chest to, to directly massage the heart and try to fix the injuries, but we couldn't save him. So many thoughts went through my head that night. What if the medics had gotten him to us faster? What if we had given him more blood? What if he had opened his chest faster? What if we just had more time to try to save his life? What if? What if? Well, it just so happens that a couple months after that, I started doing research with Peter Saffer. Peter's known as the father of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. CPR has saved countless lives of patients with non-traumatic cardiac arrest. But CPR doesn't work in trauma patients. The main reason that our trauma patients die and have cardiac arrest is because they've bled so much there's no more blood in the system. So pressing on the chest won't make a difference. And we know that about 1 in 20 of our trauma patients survive when we try to resuscitate them from a cardiac arrest. We need to do better. So Dr. Saffer, along with Ron Bellamy from the Army, looked at some data from the Vietnam War. And they noticed that there are some soldiers killed in action that died immediately. They probably have injuries that we can't fix. But there are many that died within 30 minutes to two hours. And that's a time frame in which, if we had some novel therapy, something that could actually stop the clock and buy time to try to save them, maybe more of them would live. And they often had injuries that were actually fixable. So what could we use to help buy this time? Could cooling the patient be the answer? Well, hypothermia has many potential benefits. It decreases the body's need for oxygen and blood flow, decreases free radicals, inflammation, excitation in the brain. But not so fast, say people in the trauma world. Slow down, cowboy. Hypothermia decreases the body's ability to make clots, so the patients will bleed more. It causes shivering and stress. We teach all of our trainees the lethal triad of trauma, which is hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy, which means they, they will bleed more. And the surgical dogma is that hypothermia is bad. We need to keep the patients warm. But we would disagree. And we have three factors that make us think that hypothermia could be the answer here. First, we and others had already shown that mild hypothermia after cardiac arrest could improve outcomes for non-traumatic cardiac arrest. Second, our cardiac surgical colleagues have used deep hypothermia down to around 60 degrees Fahrenheit to allow them to stop the circulation of the whole body so they could operate on a little baby with a birth defect or an adult with aortic disease. Third, there are numerous reports of patients having cold water drowning where they survived, even after being underwater for over an hour. Think about that for a second. You're underwater, can't breathe, but your body cools fast enough that your brain, your heart, your other organs are protected, and you can actually survive for over an hour. 
So we took this idea to the lab, and we call what we're working on emergency preservation and resuscitation, or EPR. We call this protection and preservation of the whole body for a period of no blood flow for two hours or more to allow transportation and control of bleeding followed by delayed resuscitation. In order to do this, all we're trying to do here is buy time to stop the bleeding. So we need to cool the body really fast. And the best way that we found to do that is to pump a large amount of ice-cold saline directly into the body, into the arteries, to cool the brain and heart as fast as possible. And when we did this, we found that the longer the period of no blood flow that we wanted, or EPR, the colder we had to go. For 15 and 20 minutes, cooling down to 93 degrees Fahrenheit is fine. But if we want to go to 60 minutes, 90 minutes, or even longer, we had to cool down to 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And when we did this, we found that with prolonged bleeding and cardiac arrest, that was survivable with EPR, emergency preservation and resuscitation, but not with standard normal temperature, CPR. We added some drugs to the saline to see if that would help. That didn't make a difference. It's just about the temperature. Most importantly, we found that we could actually repair simulated injuries using EPR. Well, given the success in the lab, we felt it was time to take this to our patients. And currently here at the University of Maryland, we're working on a study that we call the Emergency Preservation and Resuscitation for Cardiac Arrest from Trauma, or EPR-CAT. So in this trial, we tried to select patients that we think have the most potential for benefit from EPR. So specifically, we're looking at patients who've had penetrating trauma, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, 18 and 65 years of age. They lose the pulse within about five minutes of getting to the hospital. We do all the normal things we do, put in a breathing tube, give them blood, open the chest. We don't get them back. And that patient, we can then say, we'll switch gears and go to EPR. So how do we induce EPR in these patients? Well, we already have the chest open, so what we can do is put a large tube that we call a cannula directly into the aorta and pump a large amount of cold saline into the body, cool as fast as possible. And then we drain the blood and the saline out of the right side of the heart. Once the brain gets down to 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, we stop the pump, the patient meets the EPR criteria, and now we've gone to the operating room. Now, in the operating room, the trauma surgeon needs to stop the bleeding. But we also need a cardiac surgeon, because now, at this kind of temperature, the heart's not going to beat. So we need to put the patient on the heart-lung machine. Once we do that, we start the flow of blood, we give them blood, we also start warming them up slowly. And once they get up to a normal temperature, if we can regain a pulse, then we can try and take the patient off the heart-lung machine and take them to the intensive care unit. As you can imagine, this whole process takes a large multi-professional team. We need to train this team. So we have the trauma surgeons, the cardiac surgeons, trauma anesthesiologists, cardiac anesthesiologists, perfusionists that run the heart-lung machine, the blood bank, the staff, the trauma resuscitation unit, the intensive care unit, the operating room. So if we have all those team members around, we can go ahead and do EPR. If we don't, that patient can still be enrolled in the study as part of our control group, as a comparison. And our goal right now is to enroll 10 patients who get EPR and 10 who don't. In the end, our main goal with all of this is that we can hopefully save patients who otherwise would have died of their injuries and have them go back to leading normal, healthy lives. For those patients, for their families, for the trauma team, we believe that EPR could be a game changer. And hopefully, fewer parents will need to hear that a child has died. Thank you very much. <laughs>